Hi, my name is Franz Lehr and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share my work with you today and to discuss it with you. Briefly about me, I studied law and I've been a research assistant here at Skatza I in Dresden for about a year. This makes me part of the increasing number of projects at Skatza I that not only deal with AI, big data, machine learning and similar topics from a technical and computer science perspective, Rather, as humanities scholars, we try to bring in new perspectives and investigate what impact these techniques and methods have on society and the lives of each individual. Our subproject is called Transparency as a Fundamental Principle of Trustworthy AI, Regulatory Framework and Challenges. So we are looking at the transparency of AI systems. We are asking ourselves various questions such as how transparent AI systems should actually be from an ethical perspective, how these ethical requirements can be translated into concrete legal regulations, and what regulations on transparency can already be found in current legislation. Thank you, Franz, for this nice introduction of yourself and your research topic. And when it comes to new technologies, transparency and trustworthiness are always a hotly debated topic. What do you think is particularly important when it comes to the transparency and trustworthiness of AI technologies? AI is a topic that is already several decades old and has excited people ever since. The dream of building thinking machines has been around for many years, even in the realm of science fiction. But even after decades of research and science, we are currently a long way from many scenarios familiar from movies and literature such as computer that can predict everyone's behavior or rule our lives, or robots that look and behave like humans. Nevertheless, there has been great progress in development in recent years. The computing power of computers has increased dramatically, and the proliferation of the Internet and currently the Internet of Things has meant that the amount of available data has grown extremely and is increasing even more every year. Both of these have been the ingredients that have led to great advances, especially in the field of machine learning. And from the realm of science, these new possibilities have quickly found their way into practice and business. In addition, it has to be said, the economy itself is very much involved in the development in the field of AI, especially the big players like Google, Facebook and Amazon. In the meantime, there are hardly any areas in which AI technologies are not used even areas in which we often do not even expect them. We communicate with digital voice assistants or chatbots like Alexa and Siri. Companies use AI to analyze the data of their applicants and, in some cases, their communication behavior in video or audio recordings when selecting personnel and evalu evaluate them based on a scoring system. AI can be found in, invid in individualized product recommendations in navigation software, in target group analysis of potential advertising customers, in procedures for credit scoring and for insurance contracts. AI is used in displaying and moderating content in social networks. So the fields of application are diverse and complex. In addition, there's the use of AI techniques by the state, for example, in facial recognition, in the disbursement of state support benefits, in the allocation of university places, in the planning of police work and in some countries even judicial decisions. Every individual is thus confronted with AI technologies in his or her everyday life. Depending on the way of life, some more, others less. However, it is hardly possible to avoid it, for the application possibilities are too powerful, too practical and too widespread. Already now, but probably even more so in the not too distant future. This argues for regulating this important area of shaping human life and the economy as well, for not letting the community, uh, for not letting the technology spread without control, and for influencing how it develops for the benefit of all people. This is indeed a challenging topic. What are some of the ways you're currently working on combating this challenge, and what plans do you have for overcoming it in the future? As I said, we are concerned with the transparency of AI systems, or more precisely, with the legal requirements that are or should be placed on the transparency of AI systems. The starting point for our considerations was 
that there is currently a lot of discussion about whether AI systems should be transparent, why they should be, and what transparency means in general. The fact that transparency is also an ethical requirement is shown by the sheer number of ethics guidelines on how to implement AI technologies. Most of them address the topic of transparency. For example, there are the ethical guidelines drawn up by the high-level working group of the European Union. They identify transparency as one of seven requirements that must be met for AI systems to be considered trustworthy. As I said, there is now a large number of ethics guidelines. They come from states, NGOs and national and international associations. Of these, we looked at some important ones to find overarching ethical considerations and concrete ethically based requirements for transparency. We were helped by the fact that there are already a few initial systematic studies in this direction. Additionally, because widespread use of AI systems is a rather new phenomenon, there are only few evolved ethical beliefs in the population. Rather, these ethics guidelines have been established as a top-down approach and proactively by experts. We found that frequently mentioned were demands such as labeling requirements when the communication partner is a machine. Also, there was a demand for disclosure of at least the abstract functioning of the AI system in the databases used. This is especially crucial in machine learning. There were also demands of information adapted to the respective recipient. We then looked at what justifications are commonly used in legal scholarship for transparency regimes. This make it easier or even possible to apply existing legal requirements to the new AI techniques. In most cases, transparency is not seen as an end in itself, but is intended to support other legal values and purposes. For example, Transparency is intended to enable control, which serves the principle of democracy. And it also facilitates the assertion of one's own rights. Transparency is intended to establish and promote trust. And transparency can also expose discrimination. And finally, transparency is also intended to reduce imbalances and asymmetries that arise when one side has more power which is usually the state, or more recently and increasingly large companies. And when the power derives from obtaining more and more information about citizens or consumers. The goal is therefore informed decisions by empowered consumers. From a legal point of view, our project as civil lawyers is less concerned with constitutional issues. For us, the focus is on data protection law, in particular the GDPR. This contains regulations on transparency in the processing of personal data, including information rights for individuals. However, it is still an open and very controversial discussion what these should look like in concrete terms for AI systems. In addition, consumer protection law and competition law play a role for us. We are looking at what transparency rules the legal system has already in place in these areas and whether and how these can be applied to AI systems. Also, there might be a need for improvements in the existing framework in order to achieve the ethically and legally justified goals. The topic is also very much in flux, as it is justifiably very much in the focus of political and legal debate, especially at the level of the EU, which can be seen in the EU's Commission's very current proposal for AI regulation. Your future plans seem very concrete. Can you give us a little more detail about their possible limitations? Transparency is not a universal remedy. Even if AI systems could be made completely transparent and all legal problems could be solved, very important social questions would remain unanswered. For example, the question in which areas one does not want to leave decisions to AI systems or the questions on how AI decisions can be made fair. Various limits and obstacles must also be taken into account in the legal design of transparency. Not all AI techniques can be made fully explainable. They are so-called black boxes. However, a lot of research is currently being done on this topic under the keyword of explainable AI, including here at Scuds AI. 
There are also legal problems to be considered. For example, when systems are made transparent, but AP rights, such as copyrights, are violated because third parties have rights to the program code. Problems with data protection can also arise if the training data is made transparent, but they contain personal data and information about individuals. The consequences of transparency must be considered. For example, that misuse of the system may then be possible, the so-called gaming the system. The cognitive level must also be considered. Too much information can lead to information overload, which the individual can no longer process. Information must therefore always be adapted to the recipient and be multi-tiered, for example. It is clear that this research is quite challenging and in the end fairly multifaceted. How does the possible future look like of this ever-improving, ever-evolving transparency concept? Our work here at Sketch.ai tries to think technical and scientific research and humanities research together. Technical development doesn't happen in a vacuum because in the end technology is always embedded in social structures and has an impact on people's lives. Perhaps we can do some translation work in the interface between technology, ethics and law. This could lead to the disciplines engaging in conversation and that they think along with developments and suggestions from other disciplines. Moreover, as I said, AI is currently a topic that is getting a lot of attention in politics and also in law. The legislative process, especially at the EU level, is in full swing, there's a lot of discussion, nothing is fixed. Transparency is one of the major topics. In the process, politicians are always taking suggestions from the scientific community, so the scientific community as a whole can certainly exert an influence. Thank you very much, Franz. Now, let's look at the same topic from a different perspective. Today, we're also joined by Rita Jordan. Rita is a research associate at SCATS AI, working at Chair of Legal and Constitutional Studies with Interdisciplinary Relations. Can you tell us a little about your approach and from what perspective you are addressing this challenge? I'm concerned with the question of how AI systems are currently designed and how these processes can be improved in order to include constitutional and democratic values into AI systems design. This question results from the hypothesis that the creation and implementation of legal norms, such as, for example, privacy and data protection rules, is increasingly shifted from an ex post or retrospective legal control to a procedural protection of law through code in advance. In the following, I'll therefore talk about what that means exactly, using the example of data protection, which is at the center of our research at SCATS AI, and which theoretical and practical problems this could imply. Usually, the enforcement of data protection rules is structured in the following way. When an individual user, in legal language, they are referred to as data subjects, users a service, their data can be collected for a wide array of reasons, such as for a website to function properly, for a company to send out a newsletter, or to place personalized address advertisements. The user can agree to the collection, structuring, evaluation, and subsequent retention of their data. However, the rules to which a service provider may ask a user for their data are complex, thus it's oftentimes not immediately clear if a certain right is breached somewhere in the depths of the Data Protection Agreement, the DPA. Furthermore, some data collection and or um, its use may be at first lawful according to the DPA, but then later on when the reason the data was originally collected no longer exists, Retaining the data might all of a sudden constitute a breach of the data protection agreement. In order to get to their right, there are a number of obstacles for users or data subjects to overcome. Firstly, they must learn about the fact that their personal data was unlawful, unlawfully processed um, in the first place. This can be really hard because we use a wider range of services in our daily lives 
and sometimes we are not even aware which particular data is known or collected by a person or service approaching us and why, for which reason. This problem is intensified by an increase of the automated processing of user data, which can make it even harder to extract exact information about one single user, both for an individual service provider employee, but also um, according to the programming stru structure of a code itself. If a user has found out and localized about a breach of personal data, they can technically hire a lawyer to sue the service provider for a breach of the relevant law, which will mostly be the GDPR in Europe. To sue for an individual data breach will often require a relatively high effort for a lawyer in relation to the marginal damages that a claimant can receive. Therefore, the European Union is pushing for a new model of class action that can also, sorry, that also includes the case described above and allows a group of claimants um, to bring a claim against a service provider. Regardless of the specific instrument, the legal question, if there was a data breach at all, which data is affected and what consequences that entails for the claimant, the user, and the respondent, the service provider, is mostly discussed only in retrospect. Given the steps it takes for an individual to achieve compensation in any form, the detection rate will be expectedly quite low. To counter this problem, which is both owed to the real-world conditions of data processing and to the legal structure, the model of privacy by design tries to flip this coin. In theory, this is done by putting the law into the code, meaning that the respective service can automatically only fulfill certain legal requirements, such as um, collecting data in an anonymized form already, um, rather than splitting the process up and by first asking the consent of the user, then collecting the data, anonymizing it in a third step and retaining it um, or deleting it only afterwards. In the logic of the GDPR, the model of privacy by design is assumed to be more time and resource effective as well as more likely to avoid unlawful or undetected use of personal data. Thus, privacy by design seems to be a pretty smart way to overcome and counteract the problems of existing privacy regulations. However, the GDPR Articles 25 and 26 contain a rather vague obligation for controllers and data processors to implement the appropriate technical and organizational measures according to the state of the art and the circumstances. The circumstances mostly are costs, nature, the scope, context and risks for rights um, and freedoms. Until now, there is not really empirical proof to tell us in how far this obligation has really helped the data subjects to their rights, even though the hopes are still quite high. At the same time, there is a substantive concern that the shift of data protection can lead to a new legal and political problems, which I will map out in the next minutes. This means that the data protection rules are being shifted to the technological design. Are there any legal or political concerns? The term design, as it appears in the GDPR, is really wide because the intention of its creators is to keep the regulation um, so-called technology neutral, meaning that it should be applicable to the widest range of applications and technologies we can imagine. Therefore, we have to first zoom in into the question of what we can understand at design in this context of data collection. There can be a lot said about this from a technological and coding perspective, but for a legal and political view, it might suffice to briefly distinguish two layers of design. First of all, there is the software structure or the back end of an application. In this part, the developers organize issues such as which information is sent, be it personal, anonymized, pseudomized, in which way, be it encrypted or unencrypted, and where it is stored, that can be uh, central or decentral. This information often remains undisclosed to the users and can be really complex to understand the backend. In the public domain, there is a trend to require transparency or even totally open code in order to allow NGOs or interested individuals to check if the code of the backend is secure and fair. However, this is not necessarily the case if a private company develops an application. 
for the code is their property and therefore its secrets are legally protected. On top of that, it might not even be really clear what exactly the effects of a certain algorithm or a normal user are, on a normal user, are, sorry, even if the code is made public or transparent. Most of us don't know how to read it after all. And as for the second layer of design, we can look at how the information that's being processed in an application is presented to the users. It's called the front end. This translation of the back end into the front end is um, taking place in the so-called user experience design or UX design. Here, the user um, in the data protection example will be asked a number of questions regarding their consent to a waiver of rights, such as for cookies or privacy policies or the terms of service. The way that the UX design presents us the legal information highly determines how we decide about um, to answer the questions. In order to simplify this process, there are numerous examples of so-called privacy languages which seek to break the legal information down into small bits that can make the communication between the service provider and the user less complicated and ultimately allow for a, allow for a more informed decision. Both of these design layers contain many opportunities to enforce legal rules and in my opinion the designers should make use of all these opportunities. At the same time we often do not really want to concern ourselves with the legal small text but simply use a certain app or service. In that case, under the circumstances of digital capitalism that surrounds us, the power of translating the law into code grows considerably. Therefore, I think we should try and uh, not only protect, protect um, sorry, and not only make the product, which is the algorithm transparent, but also take a closer look at the very process of how an app or a service is designed. How are the legal norms taken into consideration during the development of a technology? Does the developing team or the crowd of developers take a wide range of interests into account, as we would expect it in a non-code lawmaking process? How are the participation and fairness um, of other people enforced in the design process? Is there the possibility or the will to kind of update certain features of a service if it turns out to be against the interests of the users? Are the users to be treated like a population in a democratic state? I think our research is important because by asking these questions, we can find new ways to engage with AI, give it a place in our society, because it will be a big part of our lives anyhow, and it already is. Um, so we can use it to make, um, to shape our environments in a way that improve our living together. And discussing it with anyone who is affected by it and researchers from different disciplines can be a first step to that. Thank you, Rita, for giving an insight into such a complicated subject. Thanks. I look forward to the discussion. Now it's time to look at this topic from yet another perspective. Nicholas Lange is also here with us today. Nicholas is a research associate at SCADS AI and works at the Chair of Legal and Constitutional Studies with Interdisciplinary Relations. Nicholas, what are the research questions you're working on answering and what are some of the motivations behind them? My research questions are also in the field of transparency, privacy, and data protection. In my dissertation, I deal with the phenomenon of algorithmic discrimination and the question of why this poses a problem for both society and the individual, as well as the possibilities of regulating this. As Franz explained in the beginning of the talk, AI applications have already become an integral part of our everyday lives. While the term artificial intelligence, intelligence used to refer to far future, mostly utopian scenarios of omniscient intelligence systems supporting humans or even humanoid robots, today we have to realize that most applications of artificial intelligence are much more subtle. This is because they are already being used on a daily basis in a wide variety of application areas, usually without us noticing anything about them. 
For example, they can not only assist in the planning and execution of surgical procedures or in the detection of different tumors, but also pre-structure decisions on whether and on what terms we will be approved for a loan or order, sort and curate the content of our newsfeed on Facebook or Instagram. The basis of these applications and systems are algorithms that, similar to a cooking recipe, follow a concrete and predetermined instruction in an attempt to recognize patterns in a given data set, sort or assign or classify individual data points. The great thing about these algorithms and the AI system based on them is that they can do this extraordinarily, extraordinarily well and even much better than humans. They are able to analyze large quantities of existing data in a very short time with very little effort and therefore also at low cost and to make statements about possible future developments on the basis of this data. This can be explained very clearly using the example of predicting possible future earthquakes. If we feed a suitable algorithm with all available measurements and data from previous earthquakes, it is easy to, for it to recognize, for example, patterns of tectonic plate shifts that occurred in the past shortly before an earthquake. If these shifts occur again in the future, the system can warn of the possibility of a future earthquake. This approach is already being used around the world and is a great invention that can help to save lives. However, these algorithms and AI systems are potentially problematic when they are used to make predictions or even decisions about the future behavior of society or individuals. For here, a steadily growing use of such systems can be seen. In the flood of data that we daily and inevitably create through the use of our smartphones, laptops, fitness trackers, smart speakers such as Alexa or sometimes even car, it is eminently possible to identify patterns of our past behavior from which, similar to the prediction of future earthquakes, statements about possible future behavior can be inferred. Nicholas, do you have a specific example of using such an algorithm to predict people's behavior? A particularly striking example here is that uh, one of a supermarket chain that was able to use information about the sales history of its female customers collected via a loyalty points program to draw conclusions about the purchases after which it can very probably assume that a customer is pregnant. So if a customer purchases according to this past pattern, the supermarket chain assumes that this customer is pregnant and thus um, can try to target her with advertising for pregnancy products. So depending on whether the customer already knows about this possible pregnancy herself or, for example, her environment, confronting the customer with advertising for pregnancy products can be very unpleasant or even problematic. However, the use of such algorithms and uh, system is much, systems is much more serious. For example, when the state decides on and assesses aid or penalties. If, for example, only the data on my past deeds or the pattern of data on past deeds of all persons in my situation determines whether I am seen as someone who will come to the attention of the criminal justice system again in the future, or will maybe find employment again and should therefore be supported. This contradicts the ideas of uh, resocialization and solidarity. This is particularly pro problematic. And here I build a bridge to the previous contributions. If we do not know on what basis these decisions, decisions are made or which data or information is incorporated into these decisions and to what extent. Increasingly, these algorithmic decision systems are reported to treat individual groups of people differently than other groups based on certain characteristics. Algorithmic decision systems are thus not truly objective, but often reconstruct subjective evaluation criteria that are reflected either in the data set or the structure of the system's decision chain. If this happens unjustifiably, we speak of discrimination as the unequal treatment of individuals without objective reason. 
However, as explained earlier, it is in the fundamental logic of algorithms and AI system, systems to make uh, distinctions among individual data points and information in a large data set or, and to sort or classify them. Here we see the potential for a fundamental conflict with our constitutional and democratic values, which state that people should not be treated differently or unequally than other people based on certain protected characteristics, such as ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexual identity. Can't we just identify the basis of these automatic decisions and improve them? Identifying what the decision of an algorithmic decision-making system is based on is often very difficult. However, because the individual steps are mostly not transparent and the data sets used are very large. Nevertheless, it is of course important to guarantee individual fundamental rights and freedoms as well as protection against discrimination, even uh, with the increasing use of these decision-making systems. The regulation of, protect, of a protection against discrimination must therefore be adapted to this problem in order to protect us from possible unjustified unequal treatment. The idea of improving the quality of the, of the data sets used in such a way that the systems cannot introduce potentially discriminatory errors in the, the decision-making process is in principle a good one and one that already goes a long way. For the most part, so-called direct discrimination based on defined protected characteristics can already be well prevented in this way. However, this is more difficult if the unjustified unequal treatment does not result from protected characteristics, but from information that correlates with them, for what means occurs uh, simultaneously. It is important to note here that this co-occurrence does not constitute a causal relationship, what means it is not a cause and effect relationship. For example, if I learn that I was denied a loan because I live in a neighborhood with a zip code that is predominantly inhabited by people with low incomes, this is bad for financing my planned investment, but not problematic from a legal perspective. However, if it turns out that this classification and assessment correlates with a protected characteristic, for example, religious affiliation or ethnic origin, this may constitute unjustified unequal treatment. The likelihood of finding exactly such correlations in the vast amounts of data that we generate every day and on the basis of which these decisions are pre-structured or made, and thus consciously or unconsciously, Avoiding protected characteristic is unfortunately very high. Knowing all of these challenges, what is the ultimate goal of your research? The goal of my research is therefore to find out how to ensure protect, protection against discrimination, even in times of increased use of big data and algorithmic decision-making systems. In this context, it will be important not only to address it addressed the question of the quality of the data sets, as well as the weightings of individual decision points made in the systems, but also to try to distinguish the risk potential of individual algorithmic decision systems. Beyond that, with a view to the fundamental logic of algorithms and uh, algorithmic decision systems, it seems to me to be particularly important to discuss collectively where, when, and to what extent these decisions, decision systems should be used in our society at all. Many thanks, Nicholas, Rita, and Franz for this very informative talk. In 30 minutes, we learned about three different perspectives on a very dynamic and complex topic of transparency and trustworthiness of AI. I'm sure there are a lot of questions people who have attended this lecture would like to ask. So let's start the discussion stage.